some parts we have not discussed in the previous class, so before I start on that. Yes. Sir, preference part is not clear to me. That means, uh, how do I know that people, which two group people are, which are the table and how Talk to each other. <laughs> Talk to each other. I mean, you have small <laughs> class, just 100 students. This strategy is exactly going to be like the first criteria because people will make group of two and they will only give the priority to the other. Which is fine, but I may not agree with that priority, right? <laughs> I still hold that feeler. Or third point. I may choose not to accept your papers. I say no. You can only give preference. First one, as I said, I am not going to change your group of two, but I may not, you may give more than one preference, I will decide not to take much. So this is not exactly the first package. First, I could not change anything. So this is going to be the main text for us, compiler, principle, techniques and tools, okay, by our land safety women. The standard textbook is used in compiler also popularly known as the Dragon Book. Okay? You can find a lot of copies of this in the library. If you want to buy a personal copy, then just go to Shopping Center buy it. I think it's available in a cheap Indian edition. But I have also listed a uh, lot of other books of which at least first few I also sort of use for taking some material. So as I said, this remains the base text. Then some material will also be taken from here, which is the book by Scott and book by Cooper. And the rest of the books I have listed, but these are good references for compilers, but mostly I will not use them. Okay? So as I said, first one and to some extent number two and three. But this is good to know that there are other books. This is another good book. Then this book really talks about a lot of code. So this may not go deep into the tools, but it will talk about a lot of code for compiler. This is again uh, some classical books. So, and here is a much longer list. Okay? If you just want to see these books, you can always, many of these are not in the library. You can always check them in my office. Okay? So at some point of time, at least, I have scanned all these books to find the relevant material. And I found the first one seems to be where, which can be used really for a course like CS335. Okay? Other books will have some different focus and I may not want to use them. Okay? Uh, this is very, uh, once again, I am not sure how many of you attended the previous <coughs> class because there were some 20 odd guys who were missing in the previous class. So all of you have to register on this. Now, <coughs> there is something wrong with the registration. I got a message from the PR team. You are actually going and registering on the wrong course. So please look for IITK. Within that, select CS335 and look at winter 2030. Okay. This session. <coughs> so you have to look at these keywords and then register for this course. I have asked the administrator, some of you have actually registered in the wrong course, and I have asked the administrator to shift you from that course to the more recent course, but please check that you have registered in the right course. Okay? And also, as I said, you can give feedback throughout the semester. You can use any forum you wish, personal discussion, anonymous email, email, piazza, whatever you want. Okay? Do things on time and this part we have already th sort of threshed out. Okay? We are going to make groups and we are going to have two to three <coughs> top project awards which are going to be in kind, not in cash award. Okay? Unlike all student activities, these are going to be, these are academic awards. So it's not certificate, you may get a book or some academic material. Okay? But these awards, I will decide. But those who are the award winners will be decided by you. You choose which are the three project, best projects by voting. And whosoever gets the maximum number of votes, okay? that project will be judged as the best project for award. May not be for the grade. Uh, your phones must be switched off while you are in the class. Please make sure no cheating and <coughs> come on time. Okay. Uh, today also we saw influx almost up to 97. Please avoid that. And as I said, attendance is going to be compulsory in this course. I will regularly post the attendance data 
on public forum where all of you can see that who has been attending how many classes. Okay. This data is going to be public, I am not going to hide it. Whatever attendance sheets you circulate, week by the weekends, your data will appear on the website, course website. Okay. Everyone will know who has been attending. Okay. Now, going back to <laughs> something we started discussing towards the end of the previous class, okay. uh, we started looking at a bit of history. Okay. And very quickly to cover, we said historically we did not have compilers till mid 50s, and people were using machine coding directly. But the two approaches normally for interpreting high level languages one is you want to interpret, another is you want to compile, and then there are languages which provide you a mix of both. And so this person, this gentleman, is John Backus, who actually developed the first compiler. Okay, and for that we got the Turing Award, Turing Award is the highest award a computer scientist came in. This is almost equivalent to what is known as the Nobel Prize in Sciences. So if you say there is somebody like Turing Awardee in computer science that is almost considered at that level in the world. Okay. And for this work, uh, he got Turing Award in 1976. He had a huge impact on how the languages were developed, how the languages were implemented and this project which most people believe could not be done. He really made it possible 50 years back, more than 55 years. So 1957, which was 55 years back, the first compiler was written. An interesting part was the impact of this compiler. Okay. So that really is the huge impact. And what it led to was that all these, so interesting part was that there was no theory of compilers at that point. They just wrote the compiler. And subsequent to that, people started developing theory. And all the theoretical work, which was lexical analysis, parsing, code generation, optimization, it really happened after that, after they had developed the compiler. An interesting part is we still have almost all compilers today have the same structure as the original compiler which was written 55 years back, or which was released 55 years back. The same structure is preserved. Okay. So you can see that kind of insight he had into compiler design, into implementing the languages. And kind of things they were able to do without having a formal theory into in bringing something into implementation and then subsequently during the level. Okay. So this is something you have to keep in mind that kind of things which go in compiler and historically what has happened in compilers. Okay. So this is where I would like to close the discussion as far as introduction to the course is concerned okay, and get on with the compilers. Right? Unless you have any questions or comments. Right. So let's then move on and let's try to see what do we mean by compilers. <coughs> so what is the compiler? We have been using compilers for at least two, two and a half years, right? So what is the compiler? What do you understand by it? <coughs> because this understanding is something which is going to lay the foundation for subsequent things we do in the course. Okay? Because if we don't know what a compiler is, we will not know how to build a compiler. So first thing we need to understand is what a compiler is so that we can make a compiler. Okay? So anyone, what is a compiler? I want to say something. It compiles a program, it takes a high level program and uh, can return back a, a, a executable that can be So, let me just write down some of these suggestions and then we can understand it. Okay. So, a compiler is it takes a program in level language and what it gives me is right, which executes on a machine. Sir, sir. Okay. So instead of an executable it can also give me a low level language. Right? Can 
also reject the compiler. So, is that an outcome of the compiler? Okay. So, it can also identify errors in the code. Is that what you are trying to say? Okay. Any other suggestions? It can translate <coughs> to any target language. Um, somebody is speaking. Yeah. So, it can translate the high level language code into any target language. Into any target language. So, you are saying it need not be an executable or a low level language, it could be any target language. So, is there a certain property which is being preserved when I am going through these steps? I am starting with a program and I am getting some outcome, I am doing something. Am I preserving certain property in the process of the source? Serious issue, I will uh, stop with jokes or something. I mean, what you have raised is an important point, but you need to articulate it. So, when you say essence of the program, what do you mean by essence of the program? So the semantic of the executable or the target language program or anything which the compiler gives us, does the exact thing what our program is supposed to do, if it is right. Okay. So, let me again give you certain scenarios. So, I have this program P1 in some high level language and then I have the compiler here. The compiler gives me a program P2 in some language and what you are saying is P1 and Is that doable? So first, is this doable? Remember P40? Remember theory of computation? Can I take two programs and prove that they are equivalent? Okay. Now another suggestion which came was that if P1 and we do produce same output from the same input, then they are considered equal, right? Is that what you are trying to say? Okay. They need to follow the same process also. It is not that P1 is following the for loop and P2 is following the if statement, they are giving the same output, but they are. And what is wrong with that? Because we also said that it is going to do something. Right? Because we already said that it wants to optimize. Right? So maybe the process which has been used at some level was inefficient. And therefore, the compiler now says that I can change the process itself and make it more efficient. So, perhaps that seems to be acceptable. So, we need to talk about process a little more. Okay. So, first, is this sort of acceptable definition? That is, two programs when they are executed on the same input, they will produce the same output. Then I say that P1 is equivalent with imports, not in terms of 
theory of computation, but P1 is compiled correctly into P2. Is that okay? Sir, so, if this is taking, how do you know how can we execute P1? If P1 is in a higher level, hmm. so what do you mean by executing P1? Okay. What do we mean by executing P1? I don't know. <coughs> I never said execute P1. I said P1 produces the same output when the input is given. So maybe there is no machine, but I can do a manual execution, right? I can go through a flow of the program. I can take the C program and say, go through a manual execution of the program, right? I may not have a C machine on which the C code will directly execute. Because all these points, okay, you are bringing out all good points. Okay. They are relevant, but we need to say what is more relevant and what is it that we pick up as far as compiler circumstances. Right. So, we will not know whether the two programs are equivalent, but what we can obviously test is that P1 and P2 are as far as input and output are concerned are the same. Okay. But then there are certain limitations. So, for example, if I say suppose P1 is doing sorting. Okay. And this does maybe bubble sort and this does quick sort. Okay. Compilers do not have enough intelligence built into that them that they can actually find out what the algorithm <coughs> is and then replace that by an equivalent okay. efficient algorithm. Compilers do not do that. They cannot do that. Okay. So they do not understand the application. Okay. And therefore, when we talk of translation, we need to understand that when we talk of preserving the semantics when we say it should preserve the meaning, what that means is that it is really changing the representation. So, for the time being, let us not worry about optimization, okay. But what is happening is that it is When really translation happens, what happens is that you have certain representation at high level language. Okay? So, C uses a representation where you say that I am going to declare certain variables of certain type okay? and then I will have some data structures and I will have control flow that is how my computation is represented. Okay? When it comes to machine level or when it comes to assembly language or when it comes to a different language, my representation may be different, but they are essentially computing the same thing as far as input and output is concerned. So, Compiler is only going to change the representation, is not going to try to understand what the algorithm is and when it comes to optimization, it will not try to then replace one algorithm with another algorithm, but will try to make sure that the same computation by using the different representation of the program or by using a slightly different order of execution can be done more efficiently. So, for example, it may decide that part of the code never gets executed. Why somebody may write the code like this if two then s one as s two okay and compiler may figure out that this part is always true and therefore this will never get executed and therefore decide not to even generate code for this part. Okay. So efficiency will come only in terms of eliminating part of the code which may not be properly executing or maybe changing certain representations which will say that can I achieve the same computation by doing fewer computations. Okay. So, it may decide that if you say multiply by 2, it may say oh there is no point multiplying by 2 because that is costly I may as well add it. Okay. So, only these kind of changes, these kind of optimizations it can do, it can not work at the level of algorithms that we have to understand very clearly that we are only dealing with some kind of representation and not some application and try to understand what the application is. That is beyond the scope of the compiler. So, that is what you have to keep in mind and therefore, when we start talking about what a compiler is, we all the time deal with representations and what we say is it translates one representation of the program into another representation of the program. Okay. Beyond that, we do not go into deeper into it and typically most compilers, what they will try to do is they will take a high level source language and then translate that into either a machine code or object code, but that does not exclude the scenario where I can be translating to any higher level language. So, I could be writing a compiler say for 
पास्कल टू सी और सी टू सी प्लस प्लस और सी प्लस प्लस टू सी दोज विल ऑल्सो बी फॉर कंपाइलर बट ट्रेडिशनली इफ यू लुक एट कंपाइलर देर इज दिस टर्म इज सॉर्ट ऑफ रिजर्व for the scenario where you say that i am taking a high level language and translating that into some low level representation which can then execute on a target the architect okay and source code is normally when we write source code so now we are coming to this point so what happens is when i am writing source code most of the time what i have in mind is that a human should be able to read that code and understand that because we are going to deal with the source code as human beings okay and any application okay so we are going to make it very expressive we will not worry about any kind of optimization we will not worry about even efficiencies most of us will not okay and we will also keep a lot of redundancies in the code just to avoid all kind of programming errors okay so you want to write very expressive code but what we would like to do at the machine end is that i don't want any redundancies i want to remove redundancies so remember that when we talk of optimization i'm only trying to remove redundancies from the representation and not trying to improve the algorithm per se okay and information about intent so whatever information i had about the intent of the application most of the time you'll find that in source code i don't be able to figure out that intent so many times when you read the source code you will be able to see oh this program does sorting okay when you read the machine code most of the time you will not be able to figure out what this program does so that intent will be lost in the process of changing representation from a high level language to a low level language so this really tells you about the functional specifications of what a compiler does these are the kind of things you have to keep in mind so how does it translate okay now the abstractions at the source and machine level are very different so what are the abstractions typically you may have at the source level when you deal with a programming language and you are trying to write the program in a high level language what are the kind of abstractions you will have we'll normally start with variables and you will have <coughs> operators using which you can then the expressions and once you have expressions then you would like to put con conditionals into it you would like to put iterations over it and you would like to have functions and so on. okay so depending on the richness of the language you keep on making more and more complicated but basically this is how you are going to start okay. what about machine if you are writing machine code directly what are the kind of abstractions which are available to you as a programmer what are the resources you have <coughs> so you will have certain locations so you will have memory and you will say that i'm going to put certain variables in okay you may also have resources like registers you may decide to put two things on the stack okay and then you have opcodes so opcodes are going to say that i'm going to take certain data from memory certain data from register some something from the stack and so on okay these are my opcodes and then i am going to have various addressing modes so i'll say that i am trying to get certain data from memory but it is indexed with certain register and that information indexing information is in register or i may say i will know the base address and then i am trying to get something from the base address with respect to or i am trying to get something from memory where the location is given with some offset with respect to a base address right so these are kind of abstractions you have and what a compiler has to do is it has to translate representation which is at the program level into something which is at this level so source code and machine code they are going to mismatch and normally some languages depending upon the language you have some languages are close to the machine abstraction some languages may be very far from the machine abstraction. okay so you are going to have a mismatch here okay and this gap depending upon <coughs> the kind of language and machine you may have this will be narrow or large and question is 
how do we then translate it? Right? That is what a compiler is supposed to be doing. So we want to do this translation. Okay. Now, obviously, it looks like that if I just try to translate in one go, it may not be possible. So what normally we would like to do is we will say it's a big jump, okay? And therefore, before I can make this big jump, can I take a small step? And then, as I keep taking these smaller steps, I will finally end up with a translation. Okay? Now, each small step may be a simple step, but may be a logically coherent step. Okay? And normally, compilers are designed so that at time, you take one step, but keep on moving towards this direction till you have finally reached here. Okay? And therefore, I need to understand what these small steps are. If I can understand each of these small steps, then I can reach the destination. Right? Beginning to make sense. Okay. So, what is the goal of translation? This is the translation process I follow, and what is the goal of this? Okay. One that generated code should be good, it should give me good performance. Okay. Obviously, good compile time performance because if you say that. This translation process itself is so tough that it is going to take a long time. Okay? I mean, imagine a situation where you're sitting on a terminal, you're finished writing a program, how you want to execute it, and you compile, and it says, "I'm going to take 30 minutes to compile." Will that situation be acceptable? And obviously, no. Right? Similarly, if it compiles very fast, but says, "Now I'm going to take 30 minutes to execute," okay? same scenario. This scenario will also not be acceptable. To us. So we want good performance for both the generated code and for compile time code. Okay. Now, these two issues will take up slightly later. What this means is that I want to have maintainable code because I may not be generating machine code all the time. <coughs> Suppose I am doing a high level translation. Okay. And I say that I want to convert Pascal to C. I do not want to generate C code which further cannot be maintained. Every time I do not want to go back and start maintaining my source code. Okay, so, I should be able to maintain both generated codes as well as I want to maintain my compiler code. Now, as a user, I may not be able to change compiler, but as a compiler writer, if a bug is reported, then I should be able to handle that. Many times you will say, I am using a compiler and suddenly you find a bug. Okay, I can show you even in GCC, we have found bugs. Now, somebody has to go and patch it. So, obviously, you report it back, but now they say, oh, code is so complicated, I do not even remember what to do with it. That is it. Okay. Again, that kind of scenario is not acceptable to us. Okay. So, one should be able to maintain code and one should be able to maintain high level of abstraction as far as compiler is concerned. So, as I said, these two points will become more clear as we go along. Okay. But another very important issue is the correctness. I do not want a situation where I say I compile a program, my intent was something, so I have written a program with certain intention in mind, and when the results come, they are entirely different. And why they are different? Not because my program has a bug, but because compiler has a bug. Compiler is giving me some arbitrary code. Right? So that also is a scenario which is not acceptable to us. So correctness is a very important issue. And people have tried various approaches to this. One approach in 70s and 80s was you want to prove compiler correct. You want to prove that the code you have written is correct. Now, that kind of thing has not really taken off. People were able to prove small programs correct, but typically how large a compiler is? How many lines of code a typical compiler will have? So, if I say C compiler with runtime system in full support, how many lines of code do you think it will have? About lakh, okay. And if I go for something more complex like C++ or ADA, I can hit a million and if I go some for something more complex like saying I want to support a full integrated program development environment where multiple languages can be supported, then I may go into several million. Okay. Now with that kind of code size, okay, today's technology does not does not permit us or it does not support where I can prove that what I have written is correct. And you have to go through thorough testing. And this obviously, when you try to do a correctness, is going to have an impact on the development cost. Okay. 
because you have to ensure that you have a very high degree of confidence in what you have written. Okay? Something that happens in compilers. So we will talk about how compilers are tested, how do we know that the code which is generated from compilers is correct, how do we ensure that this P1 and P2 are roughly equivalent. Okay? okay, so this is the high level compiler, right? this is the box, we do not know what is inside this box, but apparently we know what is the input to this box and what is output of this box. Right? And what we now need to understand is, so here is the high level representation, here is the low level representation, this is the box and I need to understand what are these steps I need to take, these small steps I need to take so that rather than <coughs> jumping step from here to here, I can say I can jump from one level to another and slowly keep moving towards that. Right? So what are those steps? So let me again give you a scenario. Okay. So let me just look at this word. What is the meaning of this word? Back to English or compiler. Okay. Let me give you a simpler. meaning of this sentence? How do we do that? By reading So, what is that structure? Okay, so let me let me mess up the structure first. Do you still understand the meaning of this sentence? Roughly. No, but there is an error. Right? And what is the error? <laughs> so, there is a character we do not understand. Okay? This is not in English. Okay? Therefore, for any language understanding, first thing as far as, so I am not looking at how humans go about doing it, but I am trying to say how compilers would like to do it. First thing we need to understand is what is the work of it. So, I immediately have a set of alphabets. So, when you say that, when it comes to English, normally I will say that I have these 26 alphabets, both in lower case and upper case, and then I can also use numbers and I have some punctuation marks. So I have this full stop, semicolon, colon, brackets, and so on. Okay? And that really gives me the character set. Okay? And anything which is outside this character set, first thing I say is, is not acceptable to me because this is not English. Okay? So immediately you could flag an error saying, Oh, I don't know what this character is. This is not in the character set I know and therefore is an error and you make sure that we have all proper characters of this language. Okay? So to understand a language, to understand a representation, first I must define my character set. Right? What is the next thing I will do? <coughs> Spellings. Okay? So if I gave you a spelling like this. will immediately say, I, I do not know what this word means. Okay. Now, how do I know spellings? Before spelling, do I need to do something? Before checking spelling? You did something which you are not able to articulate. So, let me say, no. What happens now? Or? What happens now? So, somewhere I was able to, while reading this, I was able to break this into words. Okay. I knew what the word boundaries were. Okay. And word boundaries here were, you were saying that whenever there is a blank, there is a word boundary. Whenever there is a punctuation, there is a word boundary. Okay. So, if I immediately put a character after dot, okay, you did not mind it. You knew that there is a word boundary. But if I do something like this, then you say there is a problem. Okay. I need to figure out what the word boundaries are. Once I have figured out all the word boundaries, then only 
I will be able to check whether this is a valid word or not. Because if I have not even identified word boundaries, how can I say this is a word or not? Okay. And how do I find out words? Okay. I have a dictionary. You can look at Oxford dictionary, you can look at any English language dictionary. Okay. Proper nouns may not be there, like CS335, which may be a proper noun here. Okay. It will not be in the dictionary. But press to the words, you will find it. Okay. Now, do we have, so let us go back to programming languages. Do I have a set of characters for programming languages? We have, right? Do I have rules for finding out what are the word boundaries? Do I have a dictionary of C? Yes? So please give me a reference where I can look at dictionary of C and I can find whether this word is in the dictionary or not. Every word is in dictionary of C? Yes, sir. We can consider it. Yeah, it can be a variable. There are different keywords. There are keywords and rules for naming. So we don't have a dictionary. What we have is a set of keywords, which is dictionary. But then we have rules for construction of valid words. So whatever is not in dictionary, I will apply certain rules to this. And I will say that whether this word conforms to the rules I have. So I will have rules for constructing what are valid numbers. I will have rules for constructing what are valid words. Okay. So I will say count is valid, this is not. Okay. Because it does not match any of the rules I have. Okay. And that will give me the words. Okay. So first thing I need to do is the first step when I start changing representation from here to here, first step I need to do is check whether all the characters are valid, break those sequence of characters into a set of words and check whether those are valid words or not. Okay. If I can do that, then it does not matter whether it is a valid sentence or not, but at least I have achieved something. Right. So this is really the first step we follow. But before we move into this first step, okay, we also need to look at that compiler really is part of why do we write programs? We are trying to solve a problem. And when I try to solve a problem, compiler only plays part of the role. There are other things which have to be working with compiler. So let us look at a big picture where compiler is part of a program development environment. So after all, if I am writing program, I need to do lot more things. Okay. So what are the other typical components? You obviously have to start with an editor after you have reached whatever operating system you have. Okay. So you need to have obviously compiler has to work under certain operating system. It needs to have support for that. I must have some editor, then I must have assembler, linker, loader, debugger, profilers and so on. Okay. So we will look at <coughs> at least introduction to all of these. And the compiler and all these tools I am talking about, they must support each other. So for example, take a scenario where your editor creates a file and it is not an ASCII file. It saves in a different format, like take Word Star or take uh, Microsoft Word. Okay. I create something. If I try to read that, it is not ASCII format. And now I write a program using, say, Microsoft Word and say, compile this program. Compiler will not be able to handle that because it uses some kind of control sequences and some kind of compressed representation. Okay. So, compiler must know this interface. Okay. And therefore, this editor must create files which my compiler can handle. Okay. And whatever is the output of my compiler, that assembler should be able to handle and so on. So what is the big picture? Big picture is that there is an editor which is which is being used by a programmer and you have a source program which comes out of this editor. But then my compiler should be able to take this source program and should be converted that into an assembly code. So you can immediately see that I am talking of an interface here. Okay. Now what do I do with assembly code? I can assemble it, it generates machine code. And then what happens? I will have to then use a linker because this may be in multiple files and I want to resolve certain symbols. So I get resolved machine code and then I am going to load this into certain machine locations and execute it. And what is the outcome of this execution? When I execute a program, what happens? This is normally what happens. <coughs> You get an error. You don't get results. Okay. Now, when you get an error, what do you do? You need to debug your program. So you start using symbolic debuggers. Okay. So therefore, debugger and compiler again have to work together. This 
representation which is coming out of compiler must be understood by the debugger okay and then debugger will the program will be executed under this control and i'll get debugging results so how do i get debugging results i have certain mental model in mind about how the computation should go about i have a mental model saying at this point of time value of variable should have been this but when i debug it i found this value was different so then i said there is something wrong with the program i go and start fixing that which is a manual process and once a programmer has done all the manual corrections then we'll go through this and at some point of time i'll get results okay but to make sure that i get results i must go through all these cycles okay so therefore what we need to make sure is that the compiler which is sitting here is able to generate information which all other tools here can use right so this is the bigger scenario and what we would like to do is stop here today and tomorrow start going into this details and then various other stuff all right so let's stop here today and it is tomorrow same time